Hi there, Coach Sage of Sage Running Podcast here with episode number 15. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Uh, thanks to all the Patreon supporters, as well as, uh, let's see, well, we'll plug Avery Brewing here uh, for a nice beverage, but also title sponsor, of course, Hoka One One, uh, keeping the running dream alive. But thanks to all you viewers on here on YouTube, but also listening, tuning in to the podcast. Uh, today, I want to do more of a kind of a nerdy, somewhat in-depth type of training talk here and uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it and uh, it's you know a reflection of kind of my own career but also just being in the sport being involved in the sport for almost two decades now uh, running reading you know two dozen different types of training books as well as influential coaches and teammates uh, and stuff I've learned along the way uh, from coaching our own athletes and, and being coaches uh, with my girlfriend Sandy Knight favorite sagerunning.com uh, we've just, uh, it's been a great experience, but you learn a lot from other people. You learn a lot from yourself and you learn a lot over time. Uh, especially when you start doing any surface, any distance, that's the hashtag I like to use. Uh, so I've, you know, raced everything from 400 meters, 800 meters in track, uh, all the way up, you know, 5k, 10k, half marathon, road marathons, and then uh, totally different mountain ultra trail running events from 12k mountain running, net uphill races, sky running types of races, 50k's, 50 miles, 100 miles on the trail, and that's where I've drawn my line so far. But uh, yeah, it's uh, been a journey, and I think, uh, you know, in terms of training parameters, uh, there's a lot that's that's uh, kind of a common theme. People say, oh, there's a lot of individual differences and there's individual differences with diet. Uh, but at the same time, we're always, we're all very much alike genetically uh, in terms of our DNA now. Some of us may be born to run uh, faster than others. There's, you definitely have to thank your parents for that when it comes to, to genetics and then resistance to injury. But I truly do believe, uh, and I know Sandy believes this, that you know, healthy diet, healthy eating, helps with longevity, uh, but also injury prevention types of things, uh, reducing inflammation, uh, you know, staying pretty lean, uh, things like that that could improve not only the running, but the health for a lot of people. And I think, uh, I mean, that's a big reason why I do this sport. It's, it's fun. It's something that I naturally kind of have a knack for. Uh, it's my job, but I also like it because of the health benefits. I try to like to think that the training process, uh, you know, to a certain extent, having a lot of aerobic exercise and, and stimulating uh, you know, your muscles uh, is a positive thing, both physically and mentally, for for longevity and health, and uh, something that's uh, part of a healthy lifestyle. Plus, uh, I could uh, eat more and, and drink some beer afterwards. It's always rewarding. So, in today's talk, uh, the main focus is going to be on a term that I call. Uh, and I don't know, maybe it's been coined in the past, but we've mentioned this in our Sage Running Secret. The Sage Running Secret, A Guide to Speedy Ultras. It's an ebook. It's on our website, sagerunning.com. It's also on Amazon Kindle. The Kindle form is the shortened version uh, without the training plans at the end, whereas the, the program on our website that you download comes with two advanced ultra training plans. And again, you know, Sandy and I just concocted a new mountain ultra trail running plan, uh, advanced mountain runner plan for 50 mile, 100K distances. It's a very advanced plan, uh, but that's up on our website now, and we're uh, working hard with. Uh, you could find, you could check out the website. Is what I'm saying, but uh, anyway, in the book, in the book uh, that we wrote a couple years ago, we talk about the term variable running economy, and I'll break down running economy first. But I basically use a lot of analogies in a book because the tried and true analogy with runners is that you compare your body, your running to uh, like a car, and uh, this is basically, are you a Mustang or Prius? It's the name of a chapter in our book, uh, Sage Running Secret. But talking about running economy is a lot, the analogy roughly translates to fuel economy in a car, right? How many miles per gallon or miles per liter, kilometers per liter, uh, you get on a certain fuel. So there's, it's, a, it's an efficiency measure, it's efficiency number, and it's really, 
I think this is the most important, and a lot of uh, exercise science guys and coaches think it's the most important parameter because it determines a lot. People get all caught up in the VO2 max number, the VO2 max test, which you kind of think of like your horsepower, right? The horsepower, top end performance, oxygen uptake, uh, you know, it's just reliant on the, the how many beats per minute your heart could do, higher maximum heart rate, but also the stroke volume, how, how big, how much blood your heart is moving with each beat. Uh, as well as you know the efficiency of your lungs and getting oxygen to uh, your working muscles, um, and that declines with age. It declines with age after probably your early 20s, if not around 18 to 20 years old. So it's a declining number. Uh, it goes down as you age, but that doesn't mean your running performances have to go down because there's running economy. Your efficiency could actually increase over age and with experience and high mileage. And I'm going to get into that into this talk and the notion of variable running economy when applying that to any surface, any distance, and so. What we see, uh, you know, running economy is like fuel efficiency in a car, and it's dependent uh, not only on you know the struts and the, the suspension of the car, it's dependent on the weight of the car. The weight of the car, it's dependent on the wind resistance, uh, you know, how the car cuts through the air. Now, we're not dealing with a lot of big drag coefficients running at you know, eight minute mile pace or uh, you know ten miles. Oh, eight, what is that? Seven and a half miles per hour, about. Uh, you know, that's not an issue, but you know, the weight is an issue. The way your legs move and your form, what shoes you wear, uh, could change your efficiency. It changes your economy. It's like changing tires on your car. You know, you got monster truck tires or you got these smooth drag racing tires, right? Uh, so, you know, those kinds of things change. You change the tires on a car, you change shoes, you change to a lighter model shoe, you change to a shoe that grips better in different conditions. Uh, so, that's kind of the idea. The analogy is, you know, how are you built naturally? You know, genetically you might not, your parents might be to blame, uh, but you know, you could change that over time maybe. You could, you could change, uh, you know, how your DNA works to some extent through healthy diet and, uh, and through exercise. You could, you know, gain more muscle mass, lose more, uh, uh, you know, lower your body fat percentage, for example, so just quick things like that. But, uh, you know, the, the analogy is that we are all different types of models of cars and maybe you're more like a Prius, maybe you're more like a Mustang, maybe you're more like a Jeep or a monster truck uh, and you're really good at, at certain things, but uh, that also is determined by other genetic factors like how many slow twitch to fast twitch muscle fibers you have, the ratio of slow twitch to muscle, fast twitch muscle fibers. So, you know, for example, Usain Bolt, 100 meter sprinter, world record holder, right? He's not a competitive half mile runner, 800 meters. People are like, oh, how could he run for 800? Or what could he, maybe he could run a sub four minute mile. He's not running a sub four minute mile. He's got too much fast twitch muscle fibers. He's specific as a sprinter. Likewise, I can't sprint worth, you know, beans. I'm, I'm a slow, super slow twitch guy. Uh, you know, anything under a mile, I don't even, I didn't run the mile competitively in college. Uh, about a 415 miler, but you know, that's nothing NCAA division one. So, you know, I had to gravitate towards the marathon in college because I knew I was slow. Uh, whereas, you know, other people, maybe they have better range, but maybe they don't. And it's kind of a liability when you have all this fast, flat track speed at, at 5K and 10K, when you move up to 100 miles in the mountains, it's a different ball game. It's a different event. And that the difference, though, comes down to what we call variable running economy. How your efficiency essentially varies over different terrain, over different durations, and at different speeds. Um, and so when I did the, you know, the, the key is running economy. Running economy can improve over age. It's your efficiency, and it's a measure. It's a measure of how much oxygen you use uh, to make your body move uh, a kilometer. And it's not so much, it doesn't go down though with an increase in speed. So. In one of my vlogs, I believe it was episode three of Training for UTMB this year, I had the VO2 max test. But the numbers that I was excited, and you know, I had a relatively low VO2 max given the 5K times that I've put down in, in college. Uh, I'm not, I knew I was in the high VO2 max runner, right? Very modest 67, 68 number when, you know, guys like, there were, there's all sorts of guys that registered in the high 70s, 80, uh, you know, Killian Jornet, uh, 87, something crazy. Um, but you know, you could register a higher VO2 max number than me, but it doesn't mean you're going to beat me in a race because it comes down to running economy and, and other factors. And so we look at with running economy is the oxygen usage to cover a kilometer. And we'll say this is on the flat because I was measured on a treadmill at different speeds. Now, I used a very similar amount of oxygen at different speeds uh, and it wasn't, it didn't necessarily, it actually got better 
going from like 12 minute and 10 minute mile pace, I got more efficient at seven to eight minute mile pace. And then even at 520 per mile pace or about 320 per kilometer pace, uh, my efficiency was almost the same uh, in terms of my running economy. Now, my heart rate was a lot higher and I was working a lot harder. I was close to four millimoles of lactate, uh, closer to my lactate threshold. Um, and you know, my uh, percentage of maximum heart rate was over 90% at 520 mile pace, right? Uh, but that is a pace that I've run for, I could cover a marathon at that kind of intensity and that kind of pace because the running economy uh, was in the 190s. It was in the 190s, it was under 200. I wasn't, uh, you know, super inefficient. So, you know, depending on other people, Frank Shorter had a VO2 max of only about 72 and he won Olympic gold. He could run a 210 marathon, right? So he had some of the best running economy that they've measured, at least for a US distance runner. So the name of the game is what I'm getting at, is running economy, your efficiency, your fuel efficiency, how you util how much oxygen you use to move your body a certain distance. And because if you're running at a slower pace, it takes you more time, uh, you know, you're breathing in and out a lot more for that time. Whereas if you're moving at a faster pace, you know, three minutes per kilometer, uh, you're covering that distance really fast, but the running economy number might be the same, uh, depending on your efficiency. Now, depending on training, depending on genetics, again, going back to the body shape, the musculature, the fast twitch to slow twitch muscle fibers, your history in running, uh, your men mental pain thresholds, uh, your shoes, all these things factoring into running economy, uh, running form being a key one, as well as you know heart and lung efficiency, uh, you know, factoring all those things in, you may be better at a certain pace range. You may be better at, at eight minute mile pace. That may be your most efficient running economy. Uh, whereas, you know, 10 minute mile pace is a little too slow for you, even though it feels a lot easier. Uh, and six minute mile pace, your running economy just deteriorates because it's, it's hard, it's, you're not used to, you haven't done a lot of speed work maybe, so your running economy is not good, but maybe you start doing some 200 meter, 400 meter repeats, all of a sudden six minute mile pace becomes more efficient. You became more economical as a runner. You start raising your mileage from 30 miles per week, 50 kilometers per week, up to uh, 50 miles per week, 80 kilometers per week. And uh, you start noticing some improvements because you have better oxygen flow, you have better uh, you know, aerobic adaptations at the cellular level, namely being mitochondria, the powerhouse in the cell. But you also have fine-tuned your stride. You fine-tuned your muscular power uh, and just efficiency. Maybe you lost a little weight. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, if you lose, get down to a lower body fat percentage, uh, stay in a healthy range, but get, you know, that's gonna improve your running economy. It's gonna improve your efficiency. So, you know, improvements can happen through training stimulus, and that's why we always have to have well-rounded training in our plans, uh, especially for the race demands at hand. Now, in mountain ultra trail running, it's really interesting because there's such a wide variety of distances and terrain and types of trails. Uh, whereas in track and road running, and I'll start off with this track example first because it's easier to understand the notion of a running economy and how it actually applies to the real world, is that, you know, basically, you're, you have strengths and weaknesses at different speeds. You have strengths and weaknesses uh, at different distances. Now, the real catch is, do you have strengths and weaknesses on different terrains, different, you know, mud versus solid pavement versus uh, running uphill versus running downhill? And what percent grade running uphill? What percent grade running downhill? Uh, and so what you look at there is, okay, let's pretend you're running seven minute mile pace, uh, you know, just a little over three minute, three hour marathon pace on a, on a nice flat track, 400 meter oval, right? It's flat, good surface, good conditions. You're clicking along, you got your, your normal shoes on, uh, you're humming along and you could measure your efficiency, your running economy at that pace for a kilometer and extrapolate it kind of, uh, for longer distances. You could say, okay, you've got this number, this running economy number for this pace on this surface. Now, Let's pretend the track turned muddy. Let's pretend it, 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 it's not a synthetic track. It's, it's a dirt track and it rained and now you're sliding, slip sliding around in the mud. You got the same shoes on, you're trying to run seven minute mile pace, the same pace. Well, for everyone, it's gonna be a lot harder to run in the slip sliding mud, right? You gotta use extra stabilizing muscles. You gotta, it, chop, it messes up your stride. Maybe you're sliding back with each step. Uh, it's really hard, but some people some people are going to be better than others in the mud. We call them mudders, right? They got a mudder stride. Uh, and, you know, it could be something you trained for. You trained in the mud, you got better at running in the mud. But some people just naturally have a knack for being better in the mud. And maybe 
they're able to run that seven minute mile pace still and not have to work that much harder. They're gonna have to work harder because everyone works harder in the mud, but maybe they don't have to work that much harder. Whereas maybe I have to work a lot harder. And so my efficiency, my running economy, uh, really took a blow there, but maybe theirs stayed relatively close to what it would have been like in dry conditions. And you know, you could translate the same notion, the same idea to, hey, you're running on a flat treadmill at that pace, at seven minutes per mile pace. Uh, we measure running economy. Now, we incline that treadmill up to 10% grade, a pretty steep hill, 10% grade, it's not douche grade, uh, it's a pretty steep grade. And all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, it's harder for everyone. It's harder for everyone to run uphill. It's a, it's a bigger work output, but some people are natural climbers, or maybe some people have done a bunch of hill repeats and a bunch of all uphill tempo runs, and they've developed a really good climbing stride and climbing efficiency. So their running economy, you know, it's more costly to go uphill, a lot more costly, but relative to their flat running performances, maybe they're performing better. They're performing better. Now at, at the same speed, seven minute mile pace on a 10% incline, that's gonna be really hard. But you know, it's all relative to are you a good climber? Well, you, you could be more efficient at climbing, you could be really not efficient at climbing. And if we look at real world examples, uh, just in my race experience and a few competitors, and I don't wanna pick on guys here because uh, these are guys that have beat me, they've totally trashed me, but I've also beat them depending on the race, depending on the day. We look at a guy like Zach Miller, and you know, North Face 50 mile champion, Lake Sonoma champion, uh, CCC champion, led UTMB most of the way, amazing athlete, amazing runner. We look at him, we look at a guy like Max King, again, amazing runner, just won the Chuck Enough 50K, blew my doors off there, 214 marathoner, Olympic trials qualifier in the steeple, sub 14 minute 5K runner, uh, been in the sport for seven years, one of the speed guys that came into the sport seven years ago, uh, Max King, world mountain running champion at 12K. Uh, we all race together. We've all raced together at this race called the Mount Washington Road Race in New Hampshire. It's a race I'm gonna do this year, actually. And it's a unique race because it's all uphill and it averages seven or 12%, 12% uphill grade. Average grade is about 12% uphill. And it's pretty steady. It's a steady climb. It's seven and a half miles, 7.6 miles, about 12 kilometers of 12% uphill grade. And it's mostly on a paved road. Part of it's a dirt road, but it's, it's good footing. It's not technical, there's no stairs. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a big race. So in that race, you could almost predict, after you've done it, <laughs> after you've done the race, you can almost predict how it's gonna pan out. Things go exponential. Uh, it's only, it only lasts for about an hour for the top guy. Um, and, you know, Max King, Zach Miller, Zach could beat Max in that race on some years. Both have been around the 62 minute range, I believe, at Mount Washington. Uh, and, you know, Max is a, a sub 14 minute 5K runner, is a 29 flat 10K runner at least. If not, I think he maybe have run faster than 29 flat for 10K. Zach Miller never ran faster than 31 minutes for 10K, right? Max probably has a big higher VO2 max than Zach Miller. Zach Miller's got sturdy, strong mountain legs though. He's a, he's a real strong climber. He's a real strong ultra runner. Uh, and he likes uphills, he likes uphills. Max does not like uphills. Max could win the world championships on a mountain running rolling course because he's, he's an amazing downhill runner, but he's not the best flat out climber. Um, and so we look at that race and you say, you look at those times and say, well, you know, Max is working really hard his efficiency is not as good on some of the all uphill, long uphill climbs. Same thing at Speed Goat. He's Ma Max King's has raced Speed Goat against Anton Krapichka. Uh, it was the first year I raced at Speed Goat. And he lost. He lost to Anton, he lost to Jason Schlarb, and he lost to myself. Uh, even though it was only a 50k, but I mean, part of that was probably the altitude. But, you know, Max doesn't like the long, steep climbs. Pikes Peak Marathon, same thing. Uh, even though he's a phenomenal, he's a phenomenal 50k ultra runner, phenomenal mountain runner, phenomenal road runner at 100k uh, even. But you know, if there's a lot of climbing, generally a runner like Max King does not like that. Uh, whereas Zach Miller, Zach Miller, a lot slower on the flat track. It's hard to say because he never ran a road marathon, but uh, you know, he, he wasn't uh, all American in college like Max King was, right? Uh, he doesn't have the fastest flat out flat speed of, of a lot of guys in the US, at least in the sport, but he's dangerous. He's a dangerous runner because he's a, not only can he climb, he's what I call a long range climber. Um, Zach Miller at, you know, Pikes Peak Ascent or, or Mount Washington, he, you know, Mount Washington he's running 62 minutes, maybe he gets third or fourth or fifth place there, uh, depending on the year. Uh, but all of a sudden you, you change that course to a 50 miler 
at North Face in San Francisco, North Face 50 Mile Endurance Challenge. She's won two years in a row. Uh, you know, 10,000 feet of climbing over 50 miles on these big rolling hills, half mile hills, 10% grade hills. You know, Zach is still climbing like a bat out of hell at mile 40 going up the Mirror Beach Hill. Uh, whenever, you know, all of us are, are getting really tired and we can't climb as well. And so it's a matter of him being able to gut that out and being really tough and being able to, to, to still climb really well after 10,000 feet of climbing. Whereas a fast, flat, you know, a road guy or a short range climber, even, you know, guys like Joe Gray who've done really well at Mount Washington, uh, you know, maybe or maybe not necessarily, they might not have the punch to, to catch or pass Zach. Probably catch Zach because Zach always takes it out in the lead. Uh, you know, at mile 40 at the North Face, and that's why Zach has won that race uh, two years in a row, and that's why when I line up against Zach Miller in a, a 50 miler that's uh, with 10,000 feet of climbing, you know it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a bloodbath because he's going to run tough there. He's going to run tough there. Or, you know, at Mount Washington, I know I could usually, it, depending on the year, beat him head to head uh, because that's a that's a you know it's only an hour race. It runs more like a half marathon. Uh, type of effort and you know coming from that background I know how to dole my effort out over half marathon I also train specifically for hill climbs uh, like Mount Washington so you know that's just one little example and I mean I don't mean to pick on Zach Miller or Max King those I just I know these guys really well I've raced them a lot over the years they're uh, you know household names or at least they should be in US mutt running because they do do any surface any distance uh, Zach hasn't done you know the road marathon stuff as much but you know he did he's done a lot of the, the races um, and a lot of different distances, short distance mountain running to 100 milers now. So, uh, you know, that's kind of the, the part of the any surface, any distance hashtag. And so the differences, the differences that I'm talking about between these runners and between your own training and your own strengths and weaknesses, as well as myself, is what I believe is variable running economy. Variable running economy, dependent on genetic factors like uh, you know how your running form is. If you're a, a good climber, uh, how you climb, your technique there. Usually, if you're a great climber, you're not as good as at descending. Uh, but then it depends: is it a smooth downhill road at negative five percent grade, or is it a super gnarly technical descent? Because you know there's a difference there. There's a difference with technical running ability as well, and, and your running economy will change, uh, you know, based if you're running in mud or sand or you're running up and down uh, a paved road like at the, the Comrades Ultra Marathon in South Africa, which is a lot more road specific. And generally we see people with, there's a high correlation with your road marathon PR on flat road courses and what you could do for a runnable, relatively flat 50K, right? There's very, they have a lot in common. A 50K and a road marathon on a flat course are, are pretty similar uh, in terms of their demands. Uh, even 50 miles, 50 milers that don't have a lot of climbing, uh, a lot of marathon-based runners, a lot of marathon experience, road marathon experience is gonna help a lot uh, in these runnable events. Now you start throwing in mountains crazy mountains, you throw in power hiking, you throw in steep grades of 20, 30, 40% grade, you throw in stairs, you throw in technical descents with rocks, and the ball game changes, right? It's the sky running type of event, you know? You want a strong mountain athlete uh, to be able to descend the mountains fast and to take risks on the technical downhill, but being able to power hike efficiently uphill. And you know, I've learned that going against Killian Jornet at the Rut 50K in uh, Montana. It's a sky running uh, World Series and you know, I'm leading most of the race, but we get to the scree fields off trail and you know, Killian scampers up ahead of me and, and then the descent, it's even worse because uh, I'm, I'm not a good downhill runner. I've, I've devoted myself more to climbing and I try to work downhill, but uh, you know, genetically, I think my efficiency is probably, running economy is a lot better on smooth runnable uphills, especially between the 10 to 15% grade range. Uh, so you find your sweet spot, you find your strengths, you find your weaknesses, you try to train to correct your weaknesses as much as possible, smooth them out so you don't lose too much ground uh, during a race, and I think we could all improve on that notion, but it is the idea of variable running economy. Now, even changing shoes, even changing shoes, right, you're running on this muddy track, at a certain pace, seven minute mile pace, you change to trail shoes with good lugs and you're gripping better. All of a sudden, boom, that, there's one change. It's like changing tires on a car, right? You went from these bald uh, nubs to getting snow tires and you know, all of a sudden you, you have better traction, you have better grip. You're generating more power uh, or you're able to more efficiently use the power your muscles are generating to move your body 
uh, you've increased your efficiency. So, so you know, same kind of notion uh, with that. Variable running economy is the name of the game for any surface, any distance. And uh, you know, in closing, I'll just reflect on myself uh, since I've. I know I'm not gonna lie. It's been a tough last two years for me. Uh, hopefully the season's going better. But uh, you know, I kind of I had some inconsistent races in the last two years, and uh, you know, I have no excuses. I think, but looking back on it again, the benefit of hindsight is that what I learned, at least with myself, uh, is that when you try to do races like road marathons, like I was trying to qualify for Olympic trials, right? So I had to run under 219. I'm trying to do the Boston Marathon, I'm doing the Comrades Ultra Marathon, another road race. Then I'm trying to do Speed Goat 50K and UTMB all in within four months of each other. It was a bad idea. It was a bad idea. And then after that I went I went back and tried to do road marathons again right after that, you know, Cal International in Houston. And what ended up happening, I you know, I did win Speed Goat that year. What ended up happening was I ran pretty well at Boston, but I missed the trials by 12 seconds still. Uh, and I didn't quite get my flat speed back for these road races that I had before because I've, I've run faster in the marathon when I focused on it. But the focus was only, it was like two months. I was like, I'm gonna do road marathon, I'm gonna run Boston, I'm, you know, have eight weeks to train for it. And then it's like, well, no, I gotta do speed goat now in July. I'm gonna, you know, I gotta get my mountain legs back. I got two months. And then it was like, well, I'm gonna do UTMB. Well, UTMB is not like the Boston marathon. Uh, and so, you know, I wanna do any surface, any distance, but. What I've learned is it's probably going to take me six months of retraining those muscles, uh, retraining the musculature, retraining your running economy, your efficiency for flat track speed, flat road running speed, versus getting your mountain legs back for being able to slog out 100 miles at the UTMB course. And, you know, that takes time. That takes time. So I do believe in any service, any distance, and I do want to try to qualify for Olympic trials in 2020, run the Boston Marathon again, and New York again, and Chicago again, Olympic trials again, uh, and do well. But I'm gonna have to give myself at least six to eight months to devote myself to flat road running and actually touch the track and do speed work. So my running economy was, was probably pretty poor at flat road running. Uh, and then transitioning into mountain running, you need to give yourself time to get your mountain legs back. I think it's easier actually to transition from the road to the mountains than it is to transition from the mountains down to the road. I think it takes more time to get flat speed back than it does to learn how to climb. But it, you know, it depends on, on how you respond to training. It depends you know, what program you follow. Are you following our periodized sage running training plan programs or you're doing hill repeats at certain times and then you're doing uphill tempo runs and workouts and hilly long runs and you know, tracking your vertical uh, and tracking you know, what percent grade you're hitting up on a treadmill workout or something like that. Or you know, are you just going out and running by feel? Are you running you know, on heart-based training? All these things uh, that could really influence your performance as well as influence how you progress as a runner. And again, you know, you could be in your 40s and 50s and still logging PRs because you still have really good running economy. VO2 max is going down with age. Maximum heart rate's going down with age. Running economy's going up. You're pulling out more of your maximum and getting more benefits. Um, that usually goes in line with lactate threshold velocity, lactate th what pace you could run at your lactate threshold. Uh, for a lot of people, it's it's what you could sustain for 60 minutes, uh, pretty much in an all-out race. Uh, so, you know, for most people, it's around 15k race pace, maybe 16k, 10 mile race pace. Uh, for me, it's closer to half marathon race pace, but it's you know significantly faster than your road marathon race pace. Lactate threshold, your economy at lactate threshold velocity is, is going to heavily determine uh, your success in the marathon as well as fueling strategies, nutrition strategies. But, you know, again, efficiency is the name of the game. Efficiency is the name of the game. Variable running economy is the name of the game when it comes to any service, any distance. And again, what I've learned is, you know, it screwed me up when I tried to transition too fast. I think I sold myself a little short in the road marathons, failed to qualify for Olympic trials by 10, 12 seconds. Uh, and then I sold myself a little short when I went to, uh, you know, doing some mountain races in even ultras like North Face, where, you know, you screw up your training just a little bit, your running economy's off, boom, you make a couple mistakes in nutrition, you hit the wall really bad, or your legs just poop out on you early in a race because you're trying to run at an aggressive pace that you think you trained for, uh, but your legs weren't ready for it. And then, you know, you, you're going backwards. So. Uh, you know, it's it's a learning process. It's something that I'm I'm still learning about with myself, with athletes uh, we coach. Uh, but it's something that you know I'm open to, and it's something that's really interesting and kind of geeky for me to talk about a lot. So that's why I'm doing this podcast mainly. But uh, you know, I hope you appreciate. Uh, 
these types of in-depth training talks. We're going to have more guests on the podcast eventually as well as uh, keep up with the UTMB training vlog, uh, training series, try to get some more scenic shots, new new drone shots. Uh, shout out to the, the drone shots. Uh, thank you for all the Patreon supporters that really have made this possible, really helped me try to up my game uh, in running related media. And yeah, feel free to comment below too with uh, future training talk topics that you guys would like to see or uh, you know share the podcast online. Uh, again, we got our Sage Running Facebook page. Uh, you could check out, I got cut off there from the camera, our website sagerunning.com where we sell uh, training plans. But also, um, you know, you can follow me on uh, Instagram, Twitter, at Sage Canada, uh, as well as uh, you can check out Sandy's face, or her uh, Instagram page as well. Um, also, uh, Sage Candy fan page on Facebook. But uh, thanks again for your support, guys. I really, really appreciate it. I uh, really hope your running season, your 2017 uh, season's going well. And thank you so much for tuning in. And stay tuned for more Sage Running Podcasts.